You're listening to the Sketchnote Army Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Rohde, the author of the Sketchnote Handbook and the Sketchnote Workbook. And this is the podcast where I chat with sketchnoters and visual thinkers and try to understand what makes them tick. This episode of the Sketchnote Army Podcast is brought to you by Neuland, the innovative maker of visual thinking tools. Every Neuland product is designed with passion to be durable and sustainable. Check out their newly redesigned Neuland Fine One line of water-based refillable markers. The rich black permanent outliner in bullet and brush options. The crisp, fine lines and rich colors of the sketch line. The flowing, variable brushes and colors of the art line. Save 15% with code AMB290425 at Neuland.com until December 31st, 2020. In this episode, I talk with James Bailey, a seasoned graphic recorder and scribe from the UK. He shares loads of great stories from his visual thinking career as he talks about how he came into his work as a consultant and then built his own business as a scribe. Learn how he's adapting his analog experience and expertise into an ever more digital world. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. I've got James Bailey on the show. James, welcome to the show. Hi, Mike. Uh, thanks for having me. Hey, you're welcome. It's uh, We actually encountered each other through the uh, Ben Fellis um, event that happened, I don't know, about a month ago. Yeah. And you were one of the two guests that were on. And I was really fascinated by your story and the longevity you've had in the space of being, uh, I guess, uh, I think we even had a discussion about the name. But uh, rather than me introducing you, I'd love you to tell us who you are and what you do. Thanks. Yeah, by all means. Um, so I'm James Bailey. I'm a, well, I think in the UK at least we're called scribes, but I believe it could be mm-hmm. graphic recorder or uh, mm-hmm. graphic facilitator. Um, there are probably a few names for it now. And I suppose I've been doing it for an unusually long time, since I think 1997. Yeah, that's, uh, you're one of the early ones. That's, that's awesome. I think I, I was an early adopter. So it was ex- just a happy accident. And, um, so I suppose it's been a long journey since then where I've worked for different institutions and then eventually I became completely sort of a solo uh, mm. freelance worker. So you've now, you're now independent. Tell me, I'm really curious now that you've sort of teased me a little bit. Tell me about your entry into visualization. What brought you into this? Did you happen to be in art school and really good at drawing? Did something like, I'm kind of curious what happened. Yeah, sure. Well, I, I was good at drawing, although the big caveat for me is that I I didn't do illustration and I'd never really attempted to do cartooning in, mm. or anything you would think that would be easily transferable to describing. So I went to art school, did fine art, you know, put those in heavy quotation marks. And uh, <laughs> I did oil painting from life. Mm-hmm. Mm. Although we weren't, I should also, you know, add that we weren't taught in any in any meaningful way. It's the kind of contemporary way of teaching art students, which is to just throw them in a room. Um, so I kind of went to art school. Um, I was sharing a studio with Andrew Park, the guy who uh, mm. does the RSA RSA movie, animate yes animates. Yep, yeah. and um, he got invited to long along to um, Ernst and Young through a friend of his, an American graphic facilitator, Peter Durand. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, Peter, the Alpha Chimp uh, scribe exactly, teacher. Exactly, yeah, he's great. Um, and I tagged along, and then it just sort of snowballed from there. Really, mm. was there for quite a few years. That sounds like quite the uh, power trio there. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, we should have formed a band. It was, uh, yeah, it, Peter was great. It was a great introduction. Scribing wasn't the only thing we did, although considering that those were our main skills, that was what we primarily did. And so it was Peter, but also there was a whole ethos behind scribing that came from M.G. Taylor, Matt and Gail Taylor. They had a kind of some very sort of clear ideas about how scribing could help group conversation. And really Hmm. it was just about very clear note taking with a few simple rules. Hmm. And uh, that's how I started, really. I know as years have gone by, people like me and Andrew are kind of known, I suppose, particularly Andrew, obviously, for... um, doing things that are very pictorial but that wasn't Mm -hmm. really how we started it was mainly just taking very clear notes 
So hmm. that's plus a words, really. So what what were the uh, principles that MG Taylor sort of had set out that sort of you guys operated by? I, don't, I would actually struggle to remember now. It was just it was almost <laughs> like take, taking because um, they weren't also very didactic. That's the the impo- important thing. Back then, it was extremely creative, and mm. we were allowed to very quickly change it in a way within reason, obviously. But the main mm. the main thing is that you're supposed to be taking the main beats of the conversation. You're supposed to be listening to clues in the conversations for when you need to drill down into making lists, like simple bullet point lists. So you need to be able to recreate the conversation in such a way that people who are in that room, and they might be in the room for several hours, they can trace back their thoughts. Hmm. So the it needed potentially to be entertaining in the way that I think scribing sometimes is now, but it definitely needed to have that very functional usage so people can trace back what everyone has said. That's pretty interesting. It almost sounds like you were taught to really capture the skeleton of a scribing session, or in, in our case, if you're doing sketch noting, it would be like sketch noting without doing the drawing, but focusing a lot more on the listening and, and uh, analysis and synthesis so that someone would see it and feel like, oh, I'm reliving that moment again. Yeah, exactly. Synthesis is important. And they, from the outset, obviously, especially if you're having someone like Peter involved, they were keen on people using images. Mm -hmm. I would just say that the stress then seemed to be on using words more than images. Now, sometimes I look at scribing and it's just really a collection of images. I know that's not necessarily what everyone does, but that definitely wasn't the case back then. It was, as I say, almost like taking notes as you would at school, really. Hmm. And so it sounds to me like uh, the three of you probably had a heavy influence on this shift. Like you had a very good foundation, it sounds like, with Mm. the bones that you were understanding, but then you sort of layered on flesh, which I guess would be the drawing and the visualization and the structure in that sense. Is that, would that be a fair way to sort of describe your part of the process? I think that's a perfect way to describe it, yeah. And as we, because obviously we're very keen to sort of show off a little bit and to entertain ourselves and outdo each other, I think, a little bit. There was some healthy competition there. So Mm. we would – I mean, we didn't work on every event with Peter because he came in from the States and, you know, for quite a few events. Mm -hmm. Um, But particularly between me and Andrew, I think there was a back and forth trying to figure out how you you used images and um, to what extent you could play with it and what worked and what didn't work. Because when I first did it, you know, you would think you'd come up with – a really good metaphor for instance something really descriptive and then you'd see people you know completely scratching their heads so you mm. had to f- fine tune all that stuff and it actually took you know quite a long time hmm. well it's really interesting that you say that you had this uh, sort of a competition a healthy competition with andrew like when i look at andrew's work when i think of it and i think of your work i think they sort of have a, a relationship like i can see that Like, I I wouldn't say you guys draw the same way or you feel, but there's a sense that you have a similar philosophy or something. I don't know how to describe it, but it feels like they're related, I guess, is what I see. And I I guess this would actually describe or maybe give me an understanding of maybe why that's true, uh, because you were doing it together in some in some sense. Yeah, I mean, that's that's interesting. you You should say that. Yeah, I don't think we do. I mean, Andrew has got an incredible visual memory and he's just a a natural illustrator in a way that I don't think I am. So we've got different styles, mm. but we mm-hmm. share, I think, an irreverence, maybe, mm-hmm. um, share a, a slightly darker sense of humor, which I think sometimes works in perhaps more corporate environments because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. people like to be taken by surprise and they like to see a different angle, you know. So we're, I suppose we're bringing that art school mentality a little bit where mm. you just want to shake things up a little bit, not, not too much. Interesting. And so then where did you go from there? Like what, it sounds like you did this for a while. Was there something in between you, this and going independent? Tell us a little bit more about your, the continued journey. Sure. Well, what happened was in the first days, the part of the organization that we worked for was called the Accelerated Solutions Environment, which I believe Ernst & Young purchased from MG Taylor. And um, the early days, it was extremely long hours, extremely creative, but quite soon it began to change, I would say. And you were, I think the exploration element sort of was dampened down quite a lot. Andrew left, I think, fairly early on to pursue scribing 
you know, by himself and to take it more seriously, I guess. Not that I didn't take it seriously, but I didn't have that level of ambition. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I kind of stayed there for maybe just over 10 years. Um, but mm-hmm. I found, especially towards the end of that time, I just needed another challenge, really. And I, need, I could see mm-hmm. that I'd reached mm-hmm. a kind of plateau because what they their vision of scribing wasn't as developed as what I mm. thought it could be, which is a shame because in the early days, I thought it was on that trajectory. But I think the people involved, I'm not criticising them, they just didn't consider the visualisation of the conversations being, I suppose, that important, really. Mm. So, yeah, I suppose after just over 10 years, I left or started to get more freelance work, and that happened alongside it for a while. And then I think about 10 years ago, I started um, Scriberia with Dan Porter and Chris Wilson. And I was not with them for that long, maybe five years in total. And then since then, I've just been by myself, really, hmm. bouncing between different clients, which has been great. Mm-hmm. It's interesting you mentioned Scriberia because, again, <laughs> there's another, like when I look at their work, I see this thread between you and Andrew and, and, and their work. So, again, it sort of feels like this connection. I can't... I can't say like, oh, this looks exactly like that. It's more like the philosophy or the, there's a something. As yeah. the French say, the je ne sais quoi, right? This undescribable thing, right? That sort of connects them together. I think you're right. And I suppose, yeah, I should say that Dan Porter, who um, started Scriberia, he was part of that whole ASE thing too. Um, mm. Probably because he was my friend from school, in fact. So, um, you know, as people do, I sort of said, oh, I know somebody who's really good at drawing is really smart and mm-hmm. uh and he joined the ASC probably not not that long after I did I can't remember now it's so long ago mm-hmm. but maybe two years or something like that okay so there's that formative time it sort of reminds me too of uh the 10 years you said that you spent there almost reminds me of uh if you know the story of the Beatles when they went to I think it was Hamburg and they spent yeah. like years and years like playing show after show after show. Yeah. And and the understanding was when they started, they weren't really, I mean, they were good enough musicians for drunk people in a German bar, I guess. But yeah. over time, they built their, that's how they really built their skills. And I, it sounds to me like maybe a lot of what you were doing there was building your skills up so that when you came to the point of going independent, you were you were ready for it. Yeah, skill wise, probably also maybe mentally, right? You had to really exhaust. Sounds to me like you were still exhausting the opportunities uh, as long as you could inside that organization. Yeah, I think you're right. I think there was plenty of experimentation. There was a hell of a lot of room to develop, um, mm-hmm. but then that that actually, as I, as I've explained, that reached very much a sort of plateau. So then I guess the impetus then was frustration, as it is mm-hmm. with lots of things in life. You just um, Sometimes you have to feel frustrated for a while yeah. to sort of move on. And that gives you energy to move forward. Yeah, that's where sketchnoting came from. I was really frustrated with the boring notes I took. And oh, really? It pushed it pushed me. Yeah, it pushed me away from... Um, I probably took an extreme version of what you talk about where everything was written in text and bullet points. And um, I felt as though I had to write every word. It wasn't even... The beats, it was everything. Yeah. I felt like, you know, a court reporter and filled these books and I used pencil in case I made a mistake. And I just got to this breaking point where like, I can't, I'm really good at this and I hate it and I can't do it yeah. anymore. What else can I do? And that pushed me to start experimenting with small books and pens and drawing and lettering. I loved lettering. So yeah, um, your lettering is amazing. Yeah. Pretty, pretty interesting how it would be really interesting to kind of look back and say, how many things were started because people were really frustrated? Probably lots of things. <laughs> yeah, I'd imagine so, yeah. Hmm. And so the thing you're doing now is you work with companies, you do the same scribing work. What gets you excited about the future of the work you're doing? What's What are the kind of projects or the things you see coming that are exciting for you now? I suppose in a way it's kind of two things. It's more of the same, but doing it better. Because although hmm. I've been doing it for a long time, I, I feel that it's got so much further to go and in terms of my own practice i think but also in terms of as a practice as a whole i think can be developed a lot more so that that excites me also working perhaps in new ways or perhaps there are certain kinds of groups that i like working with um where they're on their own kind of personal journey i'd like to do to do more of that so you can sort of almost describing becomes 
a very personal thing to them hmm. uh, that excites me so there's a lot of when there's a lot of emotion attached to it because sometimes with scribing it's it's more about information sometimes it's mm-hmm, mm-hmm. about emotion so that that excites me and then also obviously especially under the current circumstances it's uh, did the, the potential of digital scribing mm-hmm. because for me i'm actually a bit of a latecomer to that i i tend to uh, put things off um and of course right now you can't put anything off you have to bite the bullet so i've started digital scribing more and i can see a lot of potential there um i mean some people already do it so incredibly well but i feel again that the whole language and the whole way that that kind of set of tools the way they operate i think um that can bring its own special thing Hmm. yeah there's some things you can probably do that you couldn't do on a sheet of paper with a pen right um to some degree yeah and yet at the same time there's still principles that underlie everything that whether using a sheet of paper and a marker or a stylus and a screen those foundational elements are still going to be required right yeah exactly yeah you just they they, they're just tweaked i think a little bit but essentially yeah i think it yeah absolutely it's the same thing really Hmm. have you ever considered teaching your skills like you've got so much experience and probably have you probably got techniques coming out that you don't even realize have you thought about teaching sort of what you've learned well in a way i have always taught because um when i suppose because i I was one of the first people who was around i guess then obviously the people who kind of came in after me, um, I taught them usually always were actually really in a very sort of um, mm. hands-on kind of in the heat of the moment, you know, in front mm-hmm. of the client kind of way. And I, I've, I really love that. And perhaps in my more sort of solo years, I've, I've done that less and less. But I know particularly with Scriberia, um, it was my main task really, um, apart from to be, I guess, the primary scribe at the beginning, mm-hmm. was to teach all the people that they had coming in and i really enjoyed Mm. that it was an extra stress on you know doing it on the event but i really i got a lot from it it's it's great to pass Mm. on your knowledge and also you don't really know what knowledge you have do you until yeah you try and describe it that makes makes me wonder if there's a uh, an online course in james future where you can sort of teach these things how if you did an online course or even a live course like how would you do it it sounds like you (laughs) rather than just teach your knowledge and you know just go watch that it would be more interactive it seems to me when i hear you describing what you did before yeah i mean it was completely interactive so i would just i I guess i would put people in situations that were stressful enough for them to Mm. feel challenged and to sort of have enough energy i mean most scribing situations are fairly stressful aren't they um Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. i would also obviously protect them from being put on the spot too much and then Mm -hmm. sort of guide them because there are so many dials aren't there to what we do oh yeah it's kind of like one minute it'll be the spacing is off you know i guess when people start sometimes they find it hard to even write in a straight line they think they've done it okay and then they stand back and it kind of tapers Mm -hmm. off so small things like that so i would kind of give people as much as i think they could handle and then tweak all of those dials as we went along so yeah i guess it would be be quite hands-on and this is another unusual question so when you did this training like how did you convince the client that yeah, I've got this green person who's going to come and they're going to scribe this expensive event and I'm going to be with them, but you're getting like the B team player. Like how did they react <laughs> to that? Or like, how did you structure it in a way that made them feel like uh, this is normal or they didn't think about it or what have you? Um, the client. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I guess in the early days, I suppose when Scriberia was started, it was still not that much of a common practice really. So um, I guess there was a bit of leeway there because people mm. um, kind of didn't really know know what to expect, <laughs> know how you would work. And I suppose some people, we just basically reassured them that the person would not interfere with the delivery of their product. Mm-hmm. And it never did. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, you never give the new person too much work to do. Right. You would kind of, and, and actually, um, I know people who, do what we do come from all, all kinds of backgrounds and i think that's great and that's 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 the correct thing but i think with scriberia they, they were mostly i think i'm right in saying they were mostly illustrators so mm, okay. at the very least they could knock together a, a pretty good picture interesting so it's probably the, the benefit of uh the client really not knowing what to expect so what you presented was what they understood yeah. and it was such an illustrated situation 
that it would at least look good. And then maybe the things that you would work on after the fact, because, you know, once it's on the page, it's not coming off the pages. Okay. See where you did that? Like that illustration's great, but maybe this symbol would have been better or pairing it with this wording or shifting it over, you exactly. know, this yeah. over here, like those kind of things. And it's more, more of the nerdy stuff that the, that the scribes would understand. And it wouldn't like <clears throat> almost wouldn't impact like the capture, just more technical improvements or, yeah, uh, those kind of things. Absolutely, yeah, and you, you give those kind of pointers, as you say, sort of in the aftermath, but also during, like I'd always be watching mm-hmm. over their shoulder. And also the thing about scribing is, uh, I'm sure you've come across this, is the client um, is often blown away by stuff that you think you do, in all honesty, think is not not really completely right. up to scratch. Um, and I've never exploited that, obviously, because you just always want to do your very best. And mm-hmm. um, So there's also a bit of bandwidth there, I think, where... Mm-hmm. you know the new person might feel they've not done a good enough job but the client just doesn't doesn't see it you know they're just so so amazed that you're doing this live while you're speaking and things are coming on the pages it's being said exactly and they're so amazed that it gives you yeah a lot of latitude to kind of explore like to what degree you can push it and that's good that's really interesting i hadn't i hadn't really gone into the discussion wondering about that but now i would personally love to watch you building something and working and talking about why you did things. Uh, I think I, that's the way I learn. That's the way I try to teach. Yeah. Uh, so that would be really interesting f- for me to watch. I would pay to watch that actually. So oh, well, I suspect there's other people who would pay to watch that too. So maybe there's something there. I don't know. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm always up for new opportunities and, and also, yeah, that's, that's kind of you to say, I, I, yeah, I'll have to have put some thought into that. Yeah. Well, that's pretty exciting. I'm glad to hear that you see opportunity and uh, room for growth in scribing because I could certainly see where you see it as sort of like plateauing and it's just sort of the same thing over and over again. That's personally like what I try to avoid. Like if I get in a spot where I'm just repeating the same thing over and over again for different clients, like that's, I have to change something. I have to do something and improve it. <laughs> it sounds like maybe maybe you operate in a similar way to that. Yeah, definitely. Because you I think if you enjoy your job, you always want to stretch yourself, really, don't you? Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, I have a very low boredom threshold, so I kind of get bored easily, I think. And and um, so I need to surprise myself. And yeah, and I'm a, also a bit of a perfectionist. So I guess the two things combined mean hmm. I'm always trying to make it better. Hmm. Well, let's shift a little bit to how you do the work. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the tools that you love and why you use them. So talk a little bit, let's talk about analog first, since you're, you said you're uh, relatively new to digital for this purpose. Let's start with analog, since that is probably the place that you know all pens, paper, any of those kind of tools that you use and like. Yeah, so um, I guess for, for a long time, I, I just used um, chisel tip. Well, when I first started the job, it was all on whiteboard. Um, that's mm-hmm. an important distinction. And I whiteboard is great. It's got its own qualities the speed of the mark is is really nice you can get some lovely fluid fluidity and of course you especially when you're beginning the good thing is you can rub it out mm-hmm. and uh, go back to it but i don't really use whiteboards anymore i'd use paper um i can't remember the manufacturer i should have thought of this before this but i hire it from is it it's from pin, pinpoint facilitation anyway it's the standard scribe mm. paper that you know that thin okay. paper which is a little bit shiny and it's on a roll. Okay, so you can roll out as much or as little as you need to. Yeah, and then you've got those pin boards, which are on tripod stands. Mm. That is what I use. I mean, if I could, try not to use the, the stands if I can avoid them, just because they're, mm-hmm. they're reasonably expensive. And they're a bit yeah. wobbly. Yeah, and sometimes they turn up without, you know, the correct sort of stabilizing elements. Mm. It can be a real problem. So I use, but I do use, I use that paper mainly. It's really good paper. Again, it's a bit like whiteboard it's quite shiny and you can make um it offers a, a good amount of resistance but also it offers mm. a good amount of flow and then i use um on those i use brush pens really yeah wow i use the um got one here actually the um tombow dual tip oh really pens yeah and so what kind of a, is it a quite a long brush is it sort of a short brush almost like a marker shaped tip like what's the tip look like and how does that, what's the, the tip dynamics, I guess, is maybe what I'm asking about. Is it like, I, when I, when you say brush pen, I imagine this really long brush, like my Pentel pocket brush. Yeah. And, that, you know, yeah. is it like more like that or is it a little bit more stubby? Like, no, it's, it's not like that. Um, they would be great to use, but I, I, 
I would you, you probably use them really well, but I'd worry about the speed. These are kind of they're in a in a brush ish kind of shape. They mm. they kind of taper, uh, but mm -hmm. they're actually fairly firm, so you can you know give them a bit of a bashing. Really, um, mm, okay. they have they have got give to them, um, so that give allows you to create you know quite different thicknesses of mark, for instance, and gives you mm -hmm. quite a lot of control. So it's a good it's a good mixture of bouncy and firm. And now are these refillable? Like how do you do they just you buy them and you use them up and then get a new one? Or like how does that part of it work? Yeah, they're not they're not refillable. So I should mm -hmm. really think more about the environment probably. But once you I'm, I'm sure you appreciate when you find something that works. Yeah. So uh, you um you tend not to let go. But also the the brush tip, what I do is I, I keep them all for as long as possible because mm -hmm. you can use different parts of the brush the different parts of the pen for different amounts of time so mm -hmm. for like fine lettering the very which you, for which you'd use the very end of the um the brush tip that gives out fairly quickly um mm -hmm. it might only last what like a day um but then you can still use the brush tip for coloring in you can still you, you mm -hmm. know. and then there's the other end which is which is harder and a lot smaller and that just goes forever and i mm -hmm. use that when i do those single cartoons which um okay people might have seen on my instagram site um i use i use that end for those and you can sometimes you can just use one pen for like three days of quite long days so that's good for that it's a little bit like sharpie markers i know they start out really sharp and you sort of press on them for a while and they get kind of mushy that's and it. there's you know there's something nice about that actually if you if you want that right so you sort of save the mushy ones for like filling in or getting that broader line or something so you sort of take advantage of the natural degradation yeah, <laughs> of the tool right. to do the things you want to do which is always you know good adaptability i think it is it's good and i've, I've got a fair, pretty horrible way of knowing how long i've had the pen which is um, <laughs> I, chew, I chew them incessantly so if it's more chewed i can tell by how much it's chewed <laughs> by uh what it's good your tips are your covers are yeah. interesting huh and so you have this paper it sounds like it's probably intended for marker if it's uh, scribe paper, yeah, um, intended for these types of tools, which produces a good clean line. If you're laying color, it's going to make it even, but it's also probably fast drying, right? So you can move back over it quickly because you don't want to have wet marker and smear over it either. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So all those all those qualities of a it sounds like marker paper when you describe it. it probably is because it it performs you know perfectly with with markers. So it sounds like if you pin it up on a board, is the concept for a scribe to like do the work and then you trim the paper, you trim off the the pinholes to get to the like you trim the edges off, or do you just leave it the way it is, or how does that how does it go to the client? Do they typically prefer photos, or do they want the roll of paper? How does that work? Um, I always, I, I mean, for me, the the primary um, deliverable is the digitized scribe, mm -hmm. and I do a very sort of high resolution capture of that. Mm -hmm. But then on the day, I always offer them the, the paper, um, which they almost always take, um, hmm. because, you know, it's, it's fairly meaningful for them because they've, yeah. they've got me in for a reason. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, so I, I just, I'm very careful that I take enough, uh, photographs before I've hand the paper over to them. Got it. And, got it. Uh, and then I go away and usually the next day, if I, if I've got availability, then I'll just, yeah, digitize it. Hmm. So that's, we stepped away from tools, but I mean, that's part of it. That's thinking like, how do the tools function for you? Right? Yeah. Are there any other tools that you use besides the the markers and the paper? Any, um, anything that you can mention from the analog side? Well, I use pencils. I mean, I don't, um, mm. I don't draw straight. Um, I always, even if it's quite perfunctory pencil marks, I kind of I'm more sort of blocking in mm. um, where I might drop some text, but mo mostly it's kind of, um, when I'm doing it, when I'm doing a drawing, obviously my my sort of style of scribing now has become you know quite heavy on pictures. I will sort of sketch it in first with a with a pencil, hmm. and but I mean the sketching is is pretty approximate, but it's um it gives me the confidence to lay the marks down with confidence. Mm -hmm. um, and so, sometimes people have seem sort of surprised by that. Um, I think yeah, I even because Andrew the RSI Hey, and, and Andrew Park, he doesn't, um, it doesn't actually, he's actually recently started scribing again, but for, for a while he concentrated on doing the videos and he, he was surprised to hear that I used pencil and some people, people seem to be, but, um, 
but yeah i find it gives me some breathing space that increases your mm. accuracy and confidence so yeah i couldn't i couldn't uh if i turned up to, to an event and i didn't have my pencils i think i'd probably uh yeah i'd have to find one from somewhere <laughs> hmm. are there specific pencils that you that you prefer uh do they have to be soft or hard or a certain brand um they're staedtler i can't remember exactly what they are they're sort mm. of medium so they're not too mm -hmm. hard because you probably lose the sight of the mark too easily um, yeah, probably an HB or something like that. Yeah, something in the middle. Yeah, something around there, but not too soft because otherwise you'd end up with graphite everywhere, which isn't good. Yeah, either. yeah. Hmm. And then also, obviously, um, is uh, post-it notes. So it depends, hmm. on, it depends on the speed of the how the information is being delivered to you. I'm sure you know this is well. You will know it because it's the it's the main thing with scribing in a way. It's sometimes you do it completely live and you just by the seat of your pants. Mm -hmm. um, putting everything down but then sometimes you're there are lulls in the conversation or there are breaks and so you you have got time to take notes um and sometimes i do those actually on the paper and just erase them later do them in pencil mm -hmm. but sometimes i um, put them on post-it notes so i can have my scribing pro process would be covered in not covered but it would have lots of post-it notes on there Hmm. And then, so you then convert that into drawing, or do they become part of the of the page? Is it the is it an intermediate state that you use the, the post-it note, and then it turns into something on the page, and then you throw them away, or yeah, how does that work? Yeah, exactly as you said. Yeah, um, I, okay. Once or twice, I've kind of used them as a graphic element, almost where I've kind of done some fairly nice sort of uh, typography, and then sort of kept them there. But mostly, hmm. they are just for my yeah purely for my notes so i can come back when people are grabbing coffee and think mm. oh well I'll, I'll insert that image you know while mm. i've got a bit of time that's a smart way to go um i've been lately when i use the ipad i typically try to leave some white space somewhere and uh, if there's something coming fast at me i'll use that white space to write really really scribbly notes <laughs> yeah. that i can read you know and i the intention is i'll i plan to erase that thing and turn it into something proper afterwards so I think that's a good outlet to have when you sort of run into something. Sometimes I'll suggest people carry little notebooks or index cards or something so they can, if they don't want to put it on the page, you have some intermediate space because your brain, you only have so much memory, right? And at that's some true. point it gets saturated. So you don't want to miss something. So no, I think it's, yeah, it's good to say you do, you do it too. I think, oh, yeah, it's, it, that is an interesting thing. I mean, I wonder how many, how many people do do it. I, I would have imagined people, would eventually get to the same conclusion, but um, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I've, I've done that for a long time now and I prefer working that way. My least favorite sort of way of working is when you've got, you know, a really short, fast presentation and you have mm. to, you know, everything has to just go down really quickly mm -hmm. and immediately. I guess it depends a little bit on what the purpose is. You know, if it's just like you, when, when you and um, I think it was you and Ben were speaking, like I was just having fun, like, whatever whatever came out of it was fine like there was no client pressure to deliver a thing in my mind so i was just having fun yeah. drawing your faces and it looked great yeah you know if i missed a few things like ah eh, it's okay i mean you got the spirit of it right that was the purpose of that so like the the level of importance <laughs> sort of changes things and uh you know That's now cool. if if i'm doing a sermon sketch note i know that i can always go back in an hour and watch the replay if I missed something, right? When I was in the moment, that was a little bit harder. Yeah. So hopefully I'm not getting lazy. I might have to crack the whip on myself a little bit here. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I think, yeah, you just, I just think you have to be sensible, don't you? And use whatever means you you can to make it as easy mm -hmm. on yourself as possible because it is mm -hmm. fundamentally quite a crazy activity. And your brain is yeah. you know, kind of doing several things at once. So you'd be silly, silly not to a thing. But you make a good point, which is sometimes you need to know the objective to know right what kind of bridge you're building you know yeah what kind of degree of like exactness do i need to produce and i think when i think about people that are really good at their jobs there's always little tricks that they do if you're just observing you may not pick up on them but as you dig deeper you find out that they're actually doing something like oh you really do that and they use it in a really smart way that helps them like it's a means to an end it's not the end point but like using sticky notes or pencil is a intermediate step that uses a tool to get you to the end point, which is the illustration. Yeah. 
you know, so you don't kill yourself, which is really smart. And sometimes I write just the beginnings of words. Um, I don't know mm-hmm. if anyone else does mm-hmm. that. Probably, probably people do. It's little little tips like that when it's just moving really quickly and you know you're, you're on the verge of drowning. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, I call that staking. So I, so I think of it as like putting a stake in the ground, and then I'll I have yeah. enough down that I can come back and fill it in. I sort of estimate the space I'll need and come back to it. So oh, that's, that's a good. good I think that's right. pretty common. Yeah. yeah. What about anal- What about we've done analog? What about digital tools? Sounds like you, you said you just got into it. Uh, tell us about the. I assume it's some kind of digital device and software. What are those things? Yeah, so I, I guess um, everyone I know um, seems to use the same thing uh, and the same app, which is it's an iPad Pro, and then I use um, Procreate, mm-hmm. um, and um, I really love it. I know for a long time. Every time I tried to use digital, I, I never really liked the pen and the way it felt on the, mm. on the screen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then somebody one day brought one of the very first iPad Pros in with the pencil. And I was just like, this is great. I think I can finally use this. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, I didn't use it for <laughs> however long it was. But um, <laughs> I, I, I use it now. I think the pencil is the best thing I've used. I used the Wacom drawing pad for for a long time to color things mm. and that was mm-hmm. kind of all right but for actual drawing i love i really love the apple pencil and then the yeah. procreate also seems just an incredibly deep program i'm only really getting to know it um and it's um it's fidelity you know the how receptive it is to your mark making and the, it's just extraordinary really works the way you think it should work in a sense is sort of maybe the way to describe it right yeah exactly yeah produces what you want it to produce has the control that you need yeah very much so i mean it's um yeah the technology has come such a long way uh, mm. from being obviously practically non-existent from when i first started mm-hmm. um but i'm really happy with it and i think i'm almost getting to that point now where if i have to go back to um using paper and pens of course i love it but you know there's so much i mean of course with the um with the digital tools the one of the best things is the the lack of cleanup, you know, you do it, mm-hmm. you email it to the client and it's done. Um, so that's, that's also a big benefit. Hmm. So this is an interesting thing. So you use post-it notes and pencils on your paper stuff. What tricks are you using on Procreate? Are you using layers? Are you doing like, what's your, how do you achieve that same functionality in a digital realm? So for, I probably, because the, because the workspace is more confined, isn't it? On a, on a screen, mm-hmm. I wouldn't, kind of litter that with making notes with words uh, i would probably have a, just a pad of paper next to me while i do, mm. do that. um but in terms of sketching out the um the drawings first i yeah exactly as you said i use a, a layer which i just delete later mm. and so you, do you use pencil on that just to kind of stay with the theme since that's what you've used in the past or you mean what brushes do i use on the yeah so would you like do that layer and then do pencil sort of like what you would do with your paper and then oh i see what you mean you know, yeah Build on top of it. Yeah, exactly. And, and other layers. Exactly that, yeah. I wasn't sure if it was going to work. I mean, when I first started doing it, I kind of thought for some reason I just dismissed the idea of penciling it in first. But then one day I just thought, well, that's it's silly, really. I mean, it's it's designed to take that. And, and it, you know, the first time I tried it, it just worked. So, because um, it's the same thing, isn't it, in the virtual space? So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, I really I love that flexibility. It's great. I think if you look at, um, as an aside, comic book artists, um, a penciler does very much similar things. Like they start with a rough structure and and then they'll refine the pencil to a certain point. And then a lot of times they hand it over to an inker who's really good with a with their tools and they'll take the pencil and translate it into the ink. Sometimes those artists do all those things, but there is sort of a process in comics where you have this foundation and then you build on top of it. And, you know, it's blocking in and giving some structure without every detail. So there's definitely some latitude in the inking part of it, which sounds sounds a lot like your process in some senses. Yeah, I mean, I think it's apart from how good those guys are and they just blow me away mm-hmm. most of them with um, their skill skill level. But um, but in, in in essence, it's the same thing, yeah. And it, it just means that when you come to do the inking, your hand isn't trying to discover the outline or the mark, mm-hmm. it's trying to discover the form. It can just relax into being as nice as it you know, being as visually appealing as it possibly can be mm-hmm. and, and true to the form. So you're, you're just not kind of in the process of that discovery. And I, like I, I don't know if I said, but I've, I just found that I've got a very poor visual m- memory really. 
So um, I like to, yeah, I just like to be able to make the drawings look as like quote unquote realistic as possible, you know, mm-hmm. but because my visual memory is pretty poor, I, you know, I, I just need that intermediary step. Hmm. It's sort of adapting to your, like you said, you said before that um, some scribes come in as being illustrators. So maybe the challenge for a scribe who's really good at drawing and illustrating is actually the listening part, right? Where someone else maybe is really good at the listening part and they may have to build on their illustration drawing part, right? So you sort of come yeah. in with these different strengths and weaknesses. You have to accept those and you can maybe move your weakness to be a little less weak. Yeah. It's probably easier to make your strength stronger, I guess, but uh, everyone's sort of coming into it with a certain set of capabilities and you try and maximize yeah. those. I think that's what ma- what makes it exciting. And, and sometimes the most effective illustrators in, in any context, I guess, but but definitely in the scribing world, they might not be most slick at drawing um, at the mm-hmm. outset. And they, and they may end up getting to a place where it's still kind of clumsy in a way, but if they've worked at it in the right way and it's imbued with the right kind of insight, then then it can be incredibly effective. But as, as you say, you just, I mean, I'm very, very far from being good at everything and there's always something to work at, isn't there? It's kind of, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and the listening part, yeah, I remember with the, in the scribe area days perhaps the listening part was was definitely the most underdeveloped with people with those illustration skills and also they had to learn to let go because mm-hmm. they didn't like producing something that was just a bit wonky here a bit wonky there um because they're they're used to producing beautiful things i guess mm-hmm. yeah it's an interesting dance for sure isn't it it is yeah yeah it is a dance isn't it yeah well um now we're at the, por- at the part where I ask you uh, for three recommend or suggestions or advice. I don't know what I call this. The three questions of uh, things that you would recommend. I frame it as someone is listening to the show. I'm sure they are. Who's uh, excited about visualization. Maybe they've reached a plateau and they, uh, they, they need a little bit of inspiration or encouragement to improve. What would be three things you would suggest to them? Yeah. Um, let me think. So I think... The thing that you, I find you always always need to be doing is looking at other people's work and not just other mm. not just other scribes, but like for instance, I look at quite a lot of editorial cartoons. Mm-hmm. You might look at any, like different places where people just essentially where wherever visual language is employed, is there something you can take from it and try and be in diver, as diverse as possible in your? Because sometimes I think people have a very because they're perhaps perhaps it's because they they're persistently not very good at one particular thing. They kind of focus on that, and if they just keep their minds open and as broad as possible, and find inspiration from all kinds of visual language, and seeing how it can feed back into their practice, I think that's that's one big thing. And then I suppose it it depends what they've reached the plateau with, really, because as you said, you've got the illustration and the graphics side of things. But then you've also got the the listening skills, and they would, I suppose, require different things to improve. Uh, what else would I do? I think um, just constantly drawing, hmm. constantly practicing your lettering, and just I, I think not in a not in a way that in an angst ridden kind of way you're setting yourself these really you know fierce kind of tasks. I think just always keeping the pen moving, and always having a notepad. And in quite a free way, just keep, because a lot of scribing, I think, comes from the fluidity of the the mark making. Mm -hmm. Um, So, and that only comes really from having confidence and and from repetition. It's a bit like you said, to go back to the Beatles thing where you're just Mm -hmm. playing the same chords over and over again. It's repetition and practice is the main thing. And then I suppose nothing can replace the being sort of dropped into the fire really so um Hmm. just try and find as many challenging scenarios as possible perhaps sometimes if you're used to only scribing talks you could for instance try and listen more to group conversations Mm -hmm. which have a different flow to them i don't really know i suppose people do generally do both but i think just keep challenging yourself um with the kinds of things that you're listening to um, because, you know, 
sometimes things are quite staid and they're quite um they're quite full of information sometimes certain conversations they have incredible ebbs and flows and they're full of emotion and people are kind of on a quest almost as they're as they're discussing things so just keep yourself listening to as much live stuff as possible i think hmm. sort of stretching yourself because i can imagine scribing sessions at some point could start to follow the same pattern right the, there's the agenda and we do this and like it's sort of more or less going to be similar like the topic and the thing they're talking about changes but yeah. you could sort of be lulled into this um following the same pattern for everything so pushing yourself i think you even mentioned you were starting to do scribing of these discussions that were more emotional yeah where people were just i think there was i've done a few sort of leadership development um things mm. where people are on these incredibly sort of personal journeys and um mm -hmm. it's just a different kind of information and it's got a different emotional content as i say um mm -hmm. so if you can just it's keeping your ear tuned into those nuances and i think that keeps your your listening skill alive and it mm -hmm. makes it stronger i remember doing a sketch notes session for a friend who was doing like a coaching uh, she was trying to determine her next move in her career and i was honored to sit in with her and sketch noted the experience and it was really satisfying for me and she really loved it because at the end of it you know there's so much discussion it went so many directions to have someone there you can just sort of relax and then she had something to reflect on to look at and yeah. you know it wasn't by any means perfect or i did my intention wasn't to make it beautiful but i mean there were parts of it i was proud of and it gave her some a physical artifact that she could reflect on which was really cool that i really, really enjoyed that that sounds really that sounds great yeah that's exactly the kind of thing i'm talking about on that note i'm sort of a proponent of like pushing the boundaries on what can be visualize so i do football u.s football games i know there's some people that do you know uh, uh european football games and i'm sure there's hockey and baseball and That's so i mean cool. even even an event like that where it's um sudden things happen you know there's actually when, when people are surprised that i do a, a football game it's like well actually <laughs> there's a an american football particularly there's lots of downtime in between the excitement so there's actually lots of time to sort of plan your next space or to be ready and to be able to capture it. So each one is unique, right? So it's yeah, that's fun. Doing that is fun. I think yeah, that's, that's a brilliant idea. Yeah. And as you say, it's got, if it's got the stop start quality, mm -hmm. it's, it's even more of a gift really. But yeah, I, I guess we, I think scribing can just be pushed into so many different areas. Um, mm -hmm. And there's all kinds of stuff. I know people already do with education and I mean, it's, it's just that marriage of words and pictures is mm -hmm. is sort of so powerful, isn't it? And it's really, really powerful. Yeah, it's really great. It's fun when you bring it to a new space. That That's exciting for me when you bring it to a new space and the people see it like, wow, like they just are blown away because they hadn't seen it in their context before. Yeah. That's really fun. That's lovely, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah when, when it really hits home and people kind of slightly fall in love with it and and they feel like you've spoken for them in some way. That, um, yeah. Yeah. Th those are my favorite favorite moments i think mm -hmm. yeah that's and that's that's a lot of the reason i guess why i keep doing it because people see see value in it so i'm sure it's the same for you yeah definitely yeah so james how could people find you what's the best way to find uh the work you've done and social media places that you hang out so i, I suppose i'm not too strong on social media i mean i've got a, an instagram profile james describe which i've mm -hmm. um, had going for a few years now and i think that's probably the best place to go really because i can okay. throw okay. throw in everything that i've been doing recently and there's a good cross section um and i've got a website as well james the scribe but yeah i think maybe the instagram page is the, the best place to go best place to start that's that's a nice name it sort of rolls off the tongue i like it's got I, sort of a sound to it you know yeah i i, I think it as you can probably guess it was just because i was stuck for a for a better name i had lots of other more clever sounding names they never quite sat right with me so i just thought it's almost like a mm. placeholder name um but mm -hmm. i, I kind of like it so the placeholder became the the final name which is kind of cool yeah in a sense the provisional name is now the actual name exactly <laughs> like like lots of things and so we can watch that space for when you start doing your teaching sessions right james yeah i'm <laughs> right, 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 because i, I yeah I, I think it's a 
because you, you've reminded me that I did in fact teach a lot and I kind of um I see people like yourself who they are very much more visibly involved in teaching and I think it's fantastic and I sometimes think oh, I probably couldn't do that because I'm very bad with structure and um mm. I'm not very well I've got ADHD I'm not very good at mm-hmm. sort of structuring things so I kind of automatically dismiss myself from mm-hmm. being able to do something like that but I think yeah I like your idea of even if it's as basic as letting people watch me scribe yeah somehow yeah that could work that's what people have told me they really enjoy watching me working and so I'm, I'm trying to push that as a teaching method where I actually do the work and then deconstruct and I think that would be really fun even if you did some experiments on Instagram like you got the Instagram live you could sort of turn on the camera and say follow along with me as I do this and you just pick something and maybe that's a, a partnering opportunity you find someone who's really into the structure and loves to organize and then you can just relax and do the teaching that's a good idea too yeah yeah that sounds great i would love to see it well thanks james for being on the show this has been really fun oh, um we've right. got we've gotten to hear a fire truck in the background for me and a train for you and motorcycles and we just have all kinds of wonderful texture in this podcast episode um that's i love it yeah people are finally on the move again it's good <laughs> well thanks for being on the show james i really uh, appreciate uh, you being here. I appreciate the work you're doing and the wisdom that you've shared with everyone. Oh, thank Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks, Mike. Oh, you're welcome. And for everyone listening to the show, that'll wrap an episode of the Sketchnote Army podcast. Until the next episode, we'll talk to you soon. The Sketchnote Army podcast was created by me, Mike Rohde, and brought to you by Rohde Design Studios. It's produced and edited by Alec Polianis of Amp Creative Studios. The theme music was created by John Schiedemeyer. To support the creation of this show, I invite you to buy one of my books, The Sketchnote Handbook or The Sketchnote Workbook. You can find the books on Amazon or go to peachpit.com and use the code RODI40 for 40% off. Please share this podcast with other visual thinking friends and be sure to leave a nice rating on iTunes or your favorite podcast listening app so others can find the show.